let me get this out of the way quickly. As much as I love the narrow margin, as much as I think it comes as close to B-movie nirvana as any film, it still vexes me that every time I watch it, I am waiting for the shot of Marie Windsor's body being carried off the train on a stretcher. Now, if I had a noir alley time machine, and believe me, we're working on it right over here in the elevator, there are a few things I would certainly use it for, to go back in time and correct. First, I'd go back and get Ricardo Montalban cast in Touch of Evil instead of Charlton Heston. And right after that, I'd drop in at Union Station and make sure that they get the moment where Charles McGraw watches Marie Windsor's body being carted past and whispers, I don't even know her real name. How can that not be in the film? Okay, seriously. We're actually lucky the narrow margin exists at all. As I mentioned before the film, RKO studio chief Howard Hughes loved this movie. And when Howard Hughes loved something, mm, that wasn't always a good thing. Producer Stanley Rubin was stunned when Hughes, only minutes after screening the film, asked how difficult would it be to reshoot all the scenes with Charles McGraw and Marie Windsor, replacing them with Robert Mitchum and Jane Russell, and then just insert that new footage into the existing film. Now, while Reuben and Richard Fleischer were crying over this development, Hughes drew up a 13-page dossier on everything in the movie that needed to be changed. As was his want, Hughes envisioned a bigger, more exciting climax, filled with cops and crooks skirmishing throughout and on top of the speeding train. There were also two things already in the finished film that Hughes couldn't tolerate. First, the big plot twist had to be eliminated. Marie Windsor had to actually be the mob boss's wife, and Jacqueline White, who's revealed to be the actual Mrs. Neal, would just be some dame on board with no real connection to the plot. Now, Hughes's rationale was that no gangster would ever marry a woman who looked like Jacqueline White. Seriously. What would you say if I told you that I'm Mrs. Neal? You are what? I'm Frank Neal's widow, Mr. Brown. Now do you see what you've done? You couldn't be. The other big change involved McGraw's partner, played by Don Badeau, who gets killed early in the movie. In Fenton's original script, there's a devastating scene in which McGraw's do-right cop learns at the end of that knockdown, drag-out fist fight that his partner was on the take. He'd accepted a $10,000 bribe to turn Mrs. Neal over to the mob. Now, this was all shot and in the original cut, but Hughes demanded that this plot twist be eliminated. He'd allow no hint of police corruption in the film. So... 13 months after the narrow margin was completed, fill-in director William Cameron Menzies shot 19 new bits and pieces, more than 12 revised pages of script. And even after that, the narrow margin still sat on the shelf at RKO, unreleased. Fortunately, Dick Fleischer and Earl Felton came to the rescue. Specifically, they came to the rescue of another film that Hughes was threatening to sink, his kind of woman. John Farrow had finished the film, but Hughes still felt it needed just that something more. And what he demanded, of course, was precisely the slapdash Keystone Cops climax he tried to graft onto the narrow margin. Fleischer essentially ransomed the narrow margin by agreeing to salvage the third act of his kind of woman, in the process subjecting himself to months of Hughes's endless and insane tinkering. Fleischer recounts the whole crazy episode in his memoir, Just Tell Me When to Cry, and it's one of the funniest backstage tales ever, even if the director didn't find it particularly humorous at the time. Eventually, with his studio hemorrhaging money, Hughes turned the narrow margin loose, having maimed it only minimally. Released a critical acclaim in April 1952, the film would be a sleeper hit, one of the few RKO films to turn a profit that year. In the fall of 1952, Howard Hughes would sell his interest in the studio and withdraw from the movie business to devote himself full-time 
to being America's most famous filthy rich fruitcake. Can you imagine if Twitter had existed when Howard Hughes was alive? Meanwhile, Richard Fleischer, Stanley Rubin, and Marie Windsor all went on to maintain long, successful, and sane lives and careers. Now, speaking of Twitter, we've been known to do that once in a while in Noir Alley, as well as the Facebook thing. So jump on that train if you're so inclined. Next week, Noir Alley celebrates Mother's Day in time-honored tradition with a women in prison movie. And not just any women in prison movie, it's Caged, the mother of all women in prison movies. So get together with mom, make her some popcorn, and let her know if she doesn't shape up, there's a cell waiting for her at the state pen. <laughs>